basically the whole of uh, Taliban-controlled Afghanistan to hide in, and he has the support of a lot of people here. He could be hidden away in, in any village, in any uh, mountain hideaway, in any household compound here. So it would be very difficult to find him and very difficult uh, for troops to operate here without uh, the support of Pakistan, which would be essential uh, if, if uh, a ground force was to be used here, John. Nick Robertson in Kabul, Afghanistan, thank you very much. We'll check in with you a bit later in the day. I want to continue the conversation now with Peter Bergen, a CNN terrorism analyst, someone who knows the bin Laden organization quite well. Mr. Bush saying if he thinks he can hide, he will be sorely mistaken. It implies the United States, if it reaches the conclusion, Mr. Bush said he was the prime suspect, if the president gets to the next threshold and names him as the suspect and goes after him, easier said than done? Easier said than done for the following reasons, John. Afghanistan is a country of mountains and deserts uh, where it's pretty easy to hide. Uh, and uh, bin Laden has operated in Afghanistan for, since 1986. It's a country he knows intimately well. It's a country uh, he spent three years inside the country fighting the Soviets, uh, exactly the kind of conventional operation that uh, there might be implicit in some of these statements. Um, he's not exactly frightened of these kinds of things. Uh, he, he's, the psychology of this man is somebody who rejoices in the possibility of being martyred in the cause of Islam. I think he's going to be a difficult person to intimidate for that reason. The U.S. government says Mr. bin Laden is a man capable of these terrorist strikes, a man capable of having terrorist cells that can hijack planes and indeed fly them into the World Trade Center, into the Pentagon. But what about on the ground in Afghanistan? If U.S. troops were deployed there, what does Mr. Bin Laden have at his disposal in terms of men and weapons on the ground? John, I met with him in 97, and this was just for a television interview for CNN, and he had a two do at least uh, a couple of dozen heavily armed men. Uh, they had RPGs, rocket propelled propel propel grenades, they had submachine guns. Uh, these, are, these, these are people who are prepared to uh, die for him, and that was just for a television interview. Obviously, he's going to be much more prepared. He has hundreds, perhaps thousands of followers in Afghanistan. It's going to be a very tricky proposition. What about the regional balance, quickly, the Taliban threatening Pakistan if it helps the United States? What is the potential impact of that? I think Pakistan is in a very, very hard place because Osama bin Laden uh, is a popular man for a lot of Pakistanis. Uh, the Pakistani government is in a very tough situation. They've long been allies of the United States, yet bin Laden is uh, somebody who enjoys a lot of popularity on the street in Pakistan. So I think General Musharraf is going to have a very tough few weeks ahead of him. All right, and we will keep tabs on this as it develops. Now back to Paula Zahn in New York. All right, John, uh, probably uh, nothing uh, shows uh, the sense of loss that New Yorkers feel uh, today and for perhaps the, the rest of America as we focus in on the funeral of New York City's uh, fire department chaplain, uh, Michael Judge, who will be laid to rest today. Uh, it's a devastating story. Here was a man who was performing last rites to a uh, fallen firefighter and in the process lost his own life. The mayor telling us some 300 firefighters are among the missing in the World Trade Center attacks. In some cases, entire companies were lost after firefighters responded to the first attack and were killed in the second. Let's pause for a moment. He was, without knowing it, my mentor, and I was his pupil. I watched how he dealt with people. He really was a people person. While the rest of us were running around organizing altar boys and choirs and liturgies and decorations, he was in his office listening. His heart was open, his ears were opened, and especially he listened to people with problems. He carried around with him an appointment book. He had appointments to see people four and five weeks in advance. He would come to the rec room at night at 11.30, just finish his last appointment. Because when he related to a person, and you all know this, they felt like he was their best friend. When he was talking with you, you were the only person on the face of the earth. And he loved people, and that showed, and that made all the difference. You can serve people, but unless you love them, it's not really ministry. In fact, a description that St. Bonaventure wrote of St. Francis once, I think is very apt for Michael. St. Bonaventure said that St. Francis had a bent for compassion, and certainly Michael Judge did. 
The other thing about Michael Judge is he loved to be where the action was. If he heard a, a fire engine or a police car, any news, in the car he'd go and away he'd, he'd be off. He loved to be where people were active, where there was a crisis so he could insert God in what was going on. That was his way of doing things. I remember once I came back to the friary and the secretary told me, there's a hostage situation in Karlstadt and Michael Judge is up there. So I said, oh gosh. So I got in the car, drove As up there. As we hear Chaplain Michael there Judge eulogized, I also wanted to point out today, the New York City also lost its fire chief in all of this, Peter Gancy, who had spent more than 30 years with the New York City Fire Department. New York also lost its first deputy commissioner, William Feehan, who had spent almost 40 years with the department. And uh, once again, both of those were among uh, the hundreds of firefighters killed in the initial attack of uh, the South Tower and then after, of course, the second tower collapsed. At this same time in Arlington, Virginia, mourners are gathering at the Cathedral of St. Thomas More to honor Barbara Olson, the wife of Solicitor General Ted Olson. We hastily organized a holy hour for Wednesday evening. We had no way to advertise it. So we spread the news by word of mouth, hoping to get a, a group of people there to pray. More than 400 people showed up. And after it was over, I went out to greet the people and nobody came. Went in, took off my vestments, went out again, nobody came out. They stayed 10 minutes in the church praying. Every one of them. Praying for the nation, for those who died and who are injured, for those who are missing, and praying for Barbara. The last days in my parish, and I'm certain other parish, I know it's true here, the phone's been ringing off from people, not asking, demanding spiritual help, confession, masses. As Dr. Billy Graham said yesterday at the National Cathedral, perhaps a spiritual rebirth is taking place. There's something happening in America, and it's something good. God pulls good out of evil. Then there are those more than 50 New York policemen and 300 firemen who are probably dead. They gave their lives to save others. What heroism. What love. Greater love no man has than that he laid down his life for those he loves. In the midst of the rubble, Signs of love, signs of the power of life, the finger of God riding straight with crooked lines. During the devastation of World War II, Pope Pius XII said, the future belongs to those who love, not to those who hate. Barbara Olson, full of life, cheerful, laughing, smiling, loving, was the opposite of the dark powers that brought her death. But their evil deed was in vain. We are people of life, and no terrorist no matter how powerful, can take that away. As Pope John Paul II has said, when God gives life, he gives it forever. We believe in the resurrection of the body of the last day, but we Catholics also believe that the soul is immortal. It cannot be destroyed. We believe that Barbara Olson is alive not just in our hearts and in our memories, but actually alive, fully conscious and aware, now. We know this because Christ is risen from the dead. And if it isn't true, if Barbara is really gone and gone forever. Some powerful words 
about how the nation is reacting to this crisis that has unfolded in this country. You see scenes like this, uh, or have at least over the last 24 hours, repeated across the country, the president declaring yesterday a, a day of respect and, and remembrance. Uh, Reverend Billy Graham yesterday saying during the National Prayer Service, uh, where President Bush was in attendance, uh, and this is an exact quote, but how do we understand something like this? Why does God allow evil like this to take place? Perhaps this is what you're asking now. You may even be angry at God. I want to assure you that God understands those feelings that you may have. So Americans all across the country have gone to their places of worship, whether it's a synagogue, a, a mosque, a church, to try to find some sustenance during this very tough time. And uh, perhaps one part of the city uh, where uh, there is some reassuring news uh, comes from the Jacob Javits Center, where people continue to pour in from all over the country to volunteer their services. Bill Hemmer has been there all day long. And I know, Bill, you, you reported to us early on, you, you have been overwhelmed by the level of support these people are showing. Indeed, Paula, we were up here well before the sun came up today. We saw hundreds, if not thousands, of people, volunteers who are still standing in line in case their services are needed. want to bring you up to date on a bit of news, though. New York's deputy mayor just a short time ago held a press conference, and he indicated at this time that they need no more volunteers, that they are okay in that area. Let's listen to the deputy mayor now. Water. The missing reports uh, is now at... 4,972. Um, we had a few incidents through the evening. Uh, one, uh, one attempted burglary uh, at Brooks Brothers down in the site area. Um, a couple people were arrested for trespassing, and someone was arrested for uh, stealing a, uh, a fireman's jacket. Um, we're going to increase the Policing of the area uh, starting this afternoon. There will be anti crime and street crime units in there. Uh, as the deputy mayor indicated, we are uh, really, as, as much as we appreciate the volunteers, we are now going to limit the volunteers. We don't really need any more. Uh, and that goes in the area uh, of police officers as well. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask for the, the cops that are here from other jurisdictions and municipalities and states that they understand. I know everybody came here uh, for the purpose of, of helping at the site, um, but our needs at the site right now are really are being addressed. Uh, mm. Again, the police commissioner, I apologize, it was not the deputy mayor, but the police commissioner making that announcement. No more volunteers needed at this time. Indeed, they have plenty of people down at the site, but still, the volunteers are here. I tell you, the other thing that's here, Paula, quite obviously, the donations have been absolutely astounding. This is just one small street corner here. The water, the food, the clothing has been overwhelming. In fact, what you can't see, just about a block from where we are, we just took a short walk here, there are tents and tents of this same situation here where they've just been overloaded. Tell you what they do need, though. They're telling us they need boots, they need gloves, they need respirators, especially the kind that treat asbestos, the canisters that can be replaced. They're saying at this point, anything short of that, it's running out too quickly down there at the site. They said they also need safety goggles because the dust continues to come up and the rescuer's eyes. To a lesser degree, they're looking for insoles, things like foot powder and vapor rub. So that's what they're trying to get more of here at this particular point. The excess, the overflow, the food and water, is being sent across the river here to New Jersey and Giant Stadium where it's being held for a time. Now, that's the situation right now, and they have said and put up signs that they do not need any more donations of that nature at this time. But the other things we mentioned, like boots and gloves and goggles, certainly are needed at this time. Let's go further south to CNN's Martin Savage, also on the streets of Manhattan, who's working another end of the story this morning. Marty, good morning to you. Good morning to you, Bill. And we are a couple of blocks away from your location. We're actually at a site that is uh, Reed and Greenwich Street. It's about three blocks north of, well, where the World Trade Center used to be. You can probably see, and I'll actually get out of the way so you have a better view. If you look down the street here, you can see what remains, a portion at least, of the World Trade Center complex 
the building in the front there is what remains of building number seven. That was one of the smaller, lower buildings. And then all around it, 